Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, a presentation on uh, the Virgo Pisces axis. And uh, in today's discovery of consciousness and uh, just explanation of uh, archetypes through the ages, um, I really want to uh, encourage, enlighten, in, inspire a way of looking at uh, the last sort of 2000 years and uh, the way in which energy has moved through the specific archetypes over the last uh, 2000 years in particular. And um, so what I want to do today is, like I said, just uh, share a little bit about uh, what I've noticed and what I've observed and um, also share on how, how our like, social organism has actually evolved through these uh these archetypes you know what what we have been uh materializing and manifesting and what uh, types of truths we've developed over these times how we've engaged in reality what we've developed as human beings and maybe on some level there is an opportunity i'm a pluto and libra soul so i like to compare and contrast uh contrast the difference between what would be a Virgo Pisces axis of consciousness and exploration um, in human form into what would be the uh, sort of Aquarius age. But I'm not going to focus on that, um, but just how the way in which we're currently going through a cycle change right now, what is, what is really going on for us as a, as a race, how that is changing. But today's conversation is just very much about uh, the Virgo Pisces. Um, where do I begin? There's, there's actually so much information to, to share, to be honest. So I'm going to try to do this in a very sort of like uh, pace, slow paced way, if that's even possible for me, to be honest. Um, and with all that information, uh, one of the things that I've really been fascinated with this myself, with this, uh, with this presentation today and, and what I want to really share with you in terms of what I see some of it you already know, and some of it um, might be new. But what I've what I've been really fascinated by this specific material is how, as we're moving through this Pluto and Capricorn transit, and how we are moving through Pluto moving over its own south node. Okay, Pluto south nodes in in Capricorn. Pluto Jupiter south nodes. Um, in, in Capricorn, Saturn south nodes in Capricorn, and Pluto moving all over that, that stuff in Capricorn, how, how that reality, how, what that manifests, what that looks like in contrast to what archetypes we have in the most recent cellular memory that we have as human beings. So the Virgo Pisces axis over the last 2000 years for human beings is something that we can, on some level be very aware of okay you know you really just have to go back to the pluto in virgo uh, generation and look at their upbringing to really get a good understanding that we're not very far out of this or should i say we're not really um yeah not far away from what that and what the, the what that uh period of time has been like for human beings and in particular we're talking about uh, the process of religious conditioning and, and how we have explored the masculine principle in, um, in, in, the, in human behavior and, and how we are returning to a, a, a state of integration regarding a feminine principle and a masculine principle, like we're heading to, we're actually moving in that direction. Um, so the conditioning just look at the the you know many many pluto and virgos were going to church at uh, a young age and we're not really sure why they were going there and some maybe did know uh, some rejected them depending on the relationship between pluto and, and uranus in their chart but you can see that there was a lot of religious conditioning that was trying to be deconditioned and um even for myself um with a lot of virgo stuff in my chart and a lot of Sagittarius stuff in my chart, I also got exposed to that. And you now I'm born 1983. So a lot of the remnants, a lot of the archetypal lingering of these uh, expressions within our psyche are very like there. 
And um, I was reading recently while I was doing some research on this, uh, a thread on Jeffrey Wolf Green's uh, school uh, message board uh, talking about sadomasochism. Okay. And in particular, um, one person was talking about a client that they uh, were engaging with that had a South node in Pisces and a North node in Virgo. And there was this, this deep emotional like trauma, this deep emotional conditioning within the soul of prior lifetime memories of living under these experiences where there was like a uh, martyrdom, like trying to release these negative um, patterning within themselves of martyrdom, you know, the sacrifice it's living in an existence and the soul having to believe and convince itself that it needs to suffer in order for it to feel um, worthy of existing. Okay. And th those types of patterns are still on some level part of our conditioning. And I feel that as we move more into uh, the Aquarius uh, direction, Pluto's transit through Aquarius coming up, uh, I think 2027 or 2024, around about that era, um, we're going to, you know, begin to watch the process of that stuff disappearing as we begin to liberate and find more, um, you know, deeper connection to ourselves through a different framework, to a different theme pattern. So that's one positive thing to, to look at. But if you look at the, the relationship between Pluto and Virgos and what, how old you will be and how old uh, they'll be around about their time, you know, Neptune would have already moved out of Pisces and into Aries. So we're, we're looking at uh, a process here in which the polarity point of Pluto and Virgos um, would have had that Neptune move over it and everybody would have had the chance to have at least on some level uh, deconditioned themselves and uh, healed a lot of that, that um, sadomasochism. Not that every single one of you have that because that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that that type of um, stuff exists and healing that process, right? It's being dissolved. So anyway, like I said, reading, reading that and doing research found that there was a lot of information on how this lingers within our consciousness. So in today's presentation, I want to bring to our attention this kind of threading of how this has materialized over the last uh, 2000 years. Now, I have to, to say that as much as what I'm going to share today might seem like the shadowy aspects of the Virgo Pisces axis, and to be honest, there is going to be a lot of that. The Virgo of Pisces constellation and axis itself on a more higher expression has developed through, in a, in a positive way, through our deepening connection towards the universe and towards the, the idea of God and spirituality. And we are achieving a state of oneness. And I think that the state of oneness is not something that is um, existential. It's not something that is looking outside of the world and saying, oh, we're all at one and then forgiving everybody for crimes of deep, um, you know, emotional projection that, that, that we can experience from a day-to-day -day person. Like, oh, I forgive you because, you know, we're all one. Like that's, that's heavily dangerous. So it's talking about the process of realizing that we are the source of our creation and we're getting in touch with our own inner story, our own inner journey in that self and realizing that our ex outer world and our inner world are as above, so below in that interaction. So we're becoming aware of that process in a more intimate way. So that's the kind of conclusion that this Virgo Pisces axis is really looking towards. That's why if you look at the symbol of the Pisces archetype, it's the two fishes swimming in opposite direction, but they're intimately connected or the two worlds that are bound uh, through, through non-duality. Ironically, the paradox here is, is that Pisces is all about separation as well. So, there, there are positive things like seeing our world through deep mystical experiences and understanding life through and understanding and reaching experiences of God through uh, these deep mystical experiences, right? Miracles. It's not a coincidence that those words were to be, were developed during this period of time. Remember that our language and the like formation and structure of the way that we communicate with each other over these periods of time that we just take for granted and think this is how we've always spoken as human beings. Um, 
they haven't been, you know, in different ages, they've been different formulations. And so in Virgo Pisces type of language or terminology, miracles is something that would have been developed because we are seeking and seeing the universe through that lens of mysticism and mystical experiences. Wow. Amazing magic as an example. So, so just to say, as I said, again, that this presentation will look at more of the shadowy aspects of it, but it's not that that's how it was. It's just the materialization of how this has affected us on a global level and what has actually manifested in our archetypes. And maybe there's, there's a, there's a questioning within like an inquiry into your own sense of self around how you can see it in the outside world. You can see the architecture that's still there. You can still see the, the framework of how this is still in existence. And if you correlate that to Pluto transiting its own nodes, and of course, Pluto transiting through Capricorn and looking at the way that the structures are reorganizing itself relative to new consciousness that's on the planet, you can actually see that there's a beautiful connection between the Pluto Virgos and that Uranus um, Pluto connection that took place in 1965 and how that kind of emotional and spiritual and or energetic dynamic, should I say, is materializing in that crisis and the crisis is an action square where now Pluto is in Capricorn and Uranus is in Aries, right? It's that first quarter square that's materialized. We're seeing what 1965 was actually about here in 2016, 2017, really, as a lot of the structures, a lot of the, the need for freedom and authenticity is becoming even more um, profound within ourselves right now. So it's a spreading. And that's really what you get to see here with these, these archetypes. It's those archetypes of, of these last 2000 years that are really coming down and the way that we have governed ourselves, you know? Okay, cool. So I'm going to get that presentation up and running for everybody. And um, I hope that you enjoy uh, today's sharing uh, as I always do again with this. Okay. So I'm just going to move that across like that. Okay, so I've got my notes. Okay, so the picture that you're seeing on the screen right now, um, this is really profound, actually. And I feel that when we when we look at the um, Virgo Pisces axis, this, it was ushered in with um, the teachings of, you know, Christ itself. This is something that is deeply, deeply open for um, debate and inquiry in terms of the actual stories and there are different ways in which we can interpret this process but essentially what we're dealing with here is that <clears throat> this process of adam and eve and what they represent okay so step one we're dealing with adam representing the masculine principle man okay yang and we're dealing with eve who represents the feminine principle or the yin the receptive and what we're seeing here is multiple layers. So I've written it down over here. So we see that the, the process of um, the masculine principle becoming cultivated, becoming developed. So matriarchy existing in which we had this relationship to the universe and to the nature as something that was deeply receptive. We were in connection with nature and cycles and stuff. And yet this led also to the awakening of the masculine principle. And so through the stories, we have the Garden of Eden and the Garden of Eden holding the feminine and masculine principle together and then being separated, right? There's a separation that occurs. There's a split that occurs. And that's the emphasis here. There's a split that occurs between the connection to God and nature and to the experience of, of oneness, as it were, and the, dis, the exploration and expansion of the masculine principle. Okay. So Adam becomes devout. He becomes devout to the father. And immediately the terminology of the masculine principle becomes God is man. God is a masculine form. He is our father. So when you look at the deep when you look deeply into the scriptures, the, 
masculinity or the, the the archetype of God itself takes on a masculine form. It's not androgynous. It's not masculine and feminine at the same time. It's just masculine. So we have a separation, the original sin in which the masculine and feminine principles or spirit and matter, matter being feminine, spirit being masculine, spirit to matter antagonistic. And I highly encourage you to read uh, the Garden of Eden myth that was written um, in Pluto 2 with Jeffrey Wolf Green, and he gives his own version of how this process works. And this is intimately connected with the Virgo Pisces axis because we're looking at God and Pisces representing separation, right? And we're seeing the Virgo process as the original sin, okay? So there's the separation that occurs, and um, out we are cast out of this, this Eden experience, this, this heaven experience. Okay. And duality begins to form. Duality begins to form through this. And when you look at the way that we have looked at seen at the world, unless you're deeply absorbed into esoteric and occult knowledge, a lot of the world walks around in duality and only in duality. The, the body itself is not seen as the feminine principle. The body is not seen as the process of matter. And so what we have is an intense amount of disassociated souls walking around this earth in a complete mental mind frame and not connected to the body, not into the process of what the body is a vehicle. You know, the body is a diamond shape and it has this rough cut. And what we do is through an alchemical process, we come onto this plane, we receive this vessel and this vessel becomes the incarnation, incarnation, right? The body is carn, right? Meat, flesh. And we have these five senses. And when you look at uh, uh, Da Vinci's drawing of the Vesuvian man, there's the five pointed star. That type of knowledge has become just a little bit kind of put out the way. And again, there's no demonization here. Like I'm not demonizing it. We're not demonizing it here. We're saying that when it's been suppressed, it's just been removed. So all we have is the masculine principles and there's an agenda with this process. So man is now completely and devoutly looking up okay, to the heavens and the misinterpretation of the heavens is that heaven is a place that is existential that we achieve once we die. Really, it's actually the mid heaven. So the mid heaven, mid head, right here. And if you take your if you take your your geometry and you 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 take where the mid of the brain is, what do you get? The pineal gland secretes melatonin, secretes serotonin. It is the transcendence hormone within the body. So when you look at the biology and especially the the, the physiology of of the brain itself, what we're actually experiencing on a physical level is our relationship to the material plane and how we're interacting with it and how the mind and the, the prefrontal cortex, the development of, of the cerebral hemisphere, has been conditioned through these archetypes, through these teachings, so separation. Feminine is the downfall of man. Why? Because he operates through this experience of attraction. So what we have is the gender split. And if you can see over here, there's immediately a split within the gender. And this is where we don't recognize that within inside of ourselves, if you're a masculine principle, the feminine principle exists within you. Again, the anima animus process. And again, if you're female, the, the masculine principle exists within you. That's separate within us. So we see in duality. You're a woman, I'm a man. We can't complete ourselves because... We don't recognize that we are both at the same time. There's that deep conditioning, the split, the divide, and the division. Everything that is divided, everything that is split is not whole. And anything that is not whole cannot experience God in totality. So we have the Adam and Eve process here. The separation from God, okay? Duality, the two eyes. See, when we're seeing with two eyes, what we're seeing is duality. And when we see with the third eye, which is the connection of the, tr the trinity, then we are seeing awareness in the physical form. Okay. So that gets created, or that's, that's the step one process here. And I'm just going to change my things. Okay. 
Okay, so the next level in this thing is what is the human experience, right? So part of this process is the realization that if we bring it back to the body, if we bring it back to the, the human being, each of us requires security and comfort. It's a very primal thing. Our body requires emotional consistency and safety. These are primal and are the base of our needs, the Taurus archetype. So security and warmth and connection and appreciation and protection is part of me is very much about our emotions. If we can't sustain or materialize or create those types of things, then our emotional and psychological relationship towards the phenomena of reality can be extremely disturbing. Because what are we relating to? What are we sensing and making sense of? So security and comfort develops this inward, or in this particular instance, because now we're dealing with the external search. We're not searching within ourselves because we're not, we're divided. We're searching outside of ourselves. We're searching for homeland. So this astrological wheel over here correlates to the water trine, right? And we're looking for, what we're looking for is to see ourselves. We're looking for the meaning of our existence. Remember, Pisces is all about the process of the ultimate meaning. So through this 2000 year process, we're looking for the meaning. We're looking for the ultimate meaning. We're looking to the heavens, right? And, but instead of looking to the mid heaven, which is the process of spiritual ascension in the physical form, we're looking up outside of ourselves for an existential being that's non-existent that we need to believe in and so disconnected from the body, leaving the feminine behind. The material plane is not here anymore. Matter is no longer. And again, this process is the development and maturation of the masculine principle in its infancy stage. So the water trine in evolutionary astrology correlates specifically to the Pisces axis, the Pisces archetype of the meaning, the spirit, the Scorpio axis or archetype correlating to the nature of desire, right? The choice making. And then cancer is the archetype of the emotional body. It's the way that we connect with this. And that's how we identify ourselves. And this is why we are evolving through the emotional body. You must remember that now because of this process being reversed, we have emotional connection that is rooted in delusion or separateness that creates the disempowerment process in which we then have fixed emotional security patterns that are rooted in something that's not really there, the illusion of something existential, the security pattern of some existential being. And so because of that, we are basically in an incubator, an incubator in which the nature of that nurture process is deeply, deeply conditioned for outside of ourselves. So now because of this process materializing from a human connection, and the splits, we then have what? Okay, so the invent of religion, and of course the development of the patriarchy. Now the patriarchy in itself has been an intensely, like, you know, insane thing. But again, if we had to demonize it, what we would see is that this has not been, this has not been something that has been an evolution of our process you know we had to have evolved through this growing pain immature expression of the masculine principle in order for it to mature so part of this process has just been humanity just following through and then coming to this realization afterwards ah okay and religion really is just a material form and a cosmology created to do what to give us the ability to protect ourselves and to create the security and comfort in knowing that any situation that happens, say for instance, a weather storm arrived, we have technology through the mature masculine principle to measure weather and say, okay, there's a hurricane coming. Okay. Whereas before that process, the gods have sent something for us to be destroyed. And so we need to pray. Can you see the, the threading? You see the, the, the type of development of our awareness as we've needed to uh, keep ourselves safe and secure relative to the unknown. So the development of God existing outside of ourselves and is our authority through what I've just shared with you right now has created these things. I want you to look very, very closely at the architecture of 
religion through a masculine principle. What is the masculine principle? It is the process of ascension, right? It's, it's awareness. The feminine principle is earth and it's matter and it's material. It's the body. Whereas the awareness is the masculine principle. That's why knowledge seemingly always is what men are about, right? They're just, they have this, this knowledge or this technical aspect and women are deeply, deeply connected to the cycles of nature and the cycles of, of love and nurture. It doesn't mean that we're not able to do it ourselves because we're finding that androgynous balance within ourselves right now. But in terms of this process, look at how we have created. Look at the, look at the hat, right, that the Pope is wearing. Look, look at how it's designed. It is ascending. It's pointed. It's looking for the existential savior outside of ourselves. God is, the on, is right on top of it. And you look at, again, the cross. The cross represents what? right? In normal terms, just the sacrifice, the sacrifice. Jesus died on the cross. He sacrificed his life for your sins to clear us away of this process. And so therefore, just that threading on a deep, deep level has already created the psychological conditioning and dynamics in which we need to be consistently in a state of forgiveness, Pisces, relative to our sin, Virgo. We need to be of service, Virgo, to a higher omnipotent being, Pisces, that may or may not be there. It's, is it real? Is it not real? Well, we have to believe. So belief structures. And look again, look at how everything is designed. There is such a, there, if you really look at it, the feminine principle is not that aggressive. It's round and curved, orientated. It's, it's, it's supportive and, and nurturing in that sense. Whereas these these, de- these carvings, these developments are very, very, very assertive. You know, when you hear something that's yang, like especially in my voice as an example, you can see that it's, it's, it's like, again, it's, it's, I don't know how to describe, there's no words for me at this point in time, but it's, it's pointed. So there's a very like dominating expression with that pointing as it were. And again, it's all in the search for, for the process. And you can even see the Virgo details in the cloth. Look at the Virgo details. Look at the, 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 the Pisces expression of the waviness over there, right? There's such a, an interesting, when you just pay attention clearly, look at the symbolism as well. I mean, in the Aquarius age and when we work with Aquarius, there's no symbols. They're all going to disappear. We're not going to see life through symbols, Pisces, because we're not going to look at the deeper meaning. It's resonance. It's energy. It's like, do I resonate with you? Yes. Fantastic. We're, we're on the same fractal. Even the language changes, you know? So when you look at this process here, you can see that religion through the, the Virgo Pisces axis and the, the separation from God and the expression of masculine form is rooted in that. And when we look at those symbols, we translate that subconsciously. We take it for granted that that's what it's about. But these things are dying off. These processes of way of looking at reality are no longer going to be supported and are going to be actually pretty foreign to a lot of um, beings that are going to be born in the future because to them, they won't understand this process as we get more and more and more and more developed and attuned with the progression of the Aquarius energy. So I bring that there. Look at this process here. Look at the masculine form. He goes out. He's protecting. He goes out into the world, masculine, out into the world. I'm going to get a career. I'm going to get a job. I have to go do that. And what he does is he goes out and he is of service to the greater good, Pisces. And he's of service to a man that owns a company, as an example, or runs a whatever. And he is of service to that greater experience. And there is a hierarchical expression. So when you see this hierarchy translate into the family, right? Look here, the mom, the children, even the hands praying, right? And the dad, even look at his posture. Look at the posture, masculine principle, right? I need to be authoritarian in this process. Again, just very much about standing and being uh, like my decision is final in that way. I know I grew up in a home that was deeply, deeply conditioned by patriarchy and deeply, deeply conditioned by this stuff. It's, it's, okay. So See this, see this imagery here. And then look at the symbolism. Christ. Look at the umbrella. Think of this as an archetype. Arc. Okay, so we have the God consciousness, right? This would be religion. 
This would be the truths. This would be the translation of the person's boss. So this guy's name is Henry and this is his, Henry's family. And Henry goes to work and his work is at Ford, <laughs> Henry Ford, right? And Ford is the guy that created the company and his is boss. And he gives the orders down to Henry who works over here, translated as the husband. And he comes and protects the family and he provides for the family. And as he provides for the family and protects his family, his wife is under there and the children. They manage the home. But look at the hierarchical status. This is not equal. This is important, importanter, not that that's a word, and then the most least important. Think about the emotional dynamics that would have occurred where the feminine archetype says, I would like to desire to be this. Masculine principle says, well, that's absurd. How could you even desire to be that? Your job and role is here. This guy says, I would love to be that. This archetype says, no, how could you do that? Your role is to be subordinate to me, Virgo Pisces, subordination. See these archetypes materializing themselves, and they're still present in some way, shape, or form. Masculine domination, war, aggression, and the suppression of the feminine, control and domination. And again, this is a distortion and an immature expression of a lot of the things but they are also rooted from the necessity. They weren't just originated because, you know, we decided to become angry with each other. These were necessity. This was control. Because remember, the masculine principle is about control. You know? Okay. So the development and the progression into this patriarchal kind of like way of being and the way that we've developed our societies and the rules and regulations, how does that translate into the human body? So we have the left and the right brain. Remember that if you really truly want to understand the nature of Uranus, if you really want to understand the nature of Uranus, Neptune and Pluto in your chart, you want to get to, to understand that there is the division and a, and a thin veil that exists between the left and the right brain, right? And the left and the right brain. So we, we are in an incubator and we're this, this egg. And in this beautiful reality that we have, there's a thin veil of conditioning that exists between us that stops us from seeing the truth of what we are. And what we have to do is break through that Maya to see what we actually are. And that division occurs through the left brain. Remember division divide. I can't begin to tell you how much division there is on the planet at this stage. And for most of you that are watching this, you'll actually see it completely because do you vote Republican or Democrat? Do you vote for the ANC in South Africa or the DP? And it's like, we're all divided relative to our differences. And what we have here is this interesting dynamic, which as, a, as, a, as an organization or as an organism, pardon me, whatever we're going to choose a side with, it's going to be relative to our own dynamics. So when we choose a specific side, it's the mind still choosing that side or what we resonate with. But in a totality, both of them represent the same thing governance, <laughs> a need for an external authority in order for us to govern ourselves. And it's a very deep, deep, deeply ingrained, subtle, but also very profound thing within our psyche. And I think that this conversation is not a lighthearted thing as well. There are very deep thought provoking imagery that I'm trying to present here in this, in this way. So when we look at this left and this right, what we're dealing with is the left brain correlating to constitution, education, laws, history, everything that's analytical, logical. And we have the right, which is the faith, abstract, nonlinear. Okay. And when you divide the left and the right, you actually have the West and the East. Now, what's fascinating about this process, if you really look at it, a lot of the West has a very highly developed masculine principle in which we have technology that allows us to do this. Whereas in the East, up until this point in time, it's obviously we're developing. So let's not correlate to this very moment in time, but let's just go back, you know, 30, 40 years as an example, we still got technology in the, in the West, but look at how each of these separate places in the world, I mean, East and West, come on, right? Left and right brain there is a separation and there is actually a transmigration of that occurring right now on the planets, which is a representation of how these two archetypes are coming together. But in the past, there has been a separation. So 
if you're somebody that had a lot of Sagittarius in your chart, that had a deep Sagittarian right-brained expression that followed faith as an example, you know, and you looked at the world through this deep mystical experience, and then you encountered the patriarchy where in which anything that seemed to be a cult or seemed to be deeply, deeply spiritual, you were burned at a stake, plain and simple, because it was abstract and deeply, deeply disturbing to the way in which we developed religion. Because remember, and for some of you can even relate to this, there is evil, there's good and the bad, there is, there is God and there's the devil. The separation occurred. The devil, in that sense, was this beautiful, beautiful expression of the feminine form but it's just been massively distorted and pushed aside for the rejection of it. Because the moment that we become aware of the physical form as where the tree of knowledge exists, tree of knowledge, right? Branch, branch, center, right? When we have the tree of knowledge and we, we access the deep wisdom that lies within ourselves relative to the, the chemical process of the, um, uh, the pineal gland and how the cerebral fluid moves up the spine through the sexual energy, we recognize that any form of body is just being completely rejected. So if you had faith in that process, then you would be burned to the stake. And then with the left, you just had to follow these rules and regulations. And think about how many times you've been in a situation in which logic has completely overridden the emotional nature and how you felt about that process. Think about a computer, for instance. It can't do anything unless we program it to do something. It's deeply logical. Right? Even AI is an example with a deep debate on whether robots and uh, those types of things should be in existence. The film AI in itself provides that with that type of like deep philosophical understanding. Matrix as an example. You know, do robots have emotion? How do you put emotion into to robots? Because human beings are emotional in that process. It will makes us the capacity to have empathy. But something that's logical in that sense doesn't work so much for that. So we have the law, okay? I just wanna look at my notes over here. So the left brain correlates to this linearity, this logic, lingo, okay, language, and language and communication, and look at the Tower of Babylon, right? When, 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 they, when they talk about, let's we, let us go descend into the body, into the physical form and confuse them, what we developed was the separation between the two hemispheres and then the confusion. So doubt, doubt is duality. I doubt this. Is it this or is it not this? Confusion. So when we're in this process of the separation between the left and right brain, people that have developed an over left brain through academia are simply just on some level, not able to see the more like feminine process in which we can see medicine. And medicine is a great example. So we've got the masculine form of medicine, which is to be very aggressive and to go into there and attack it from the outside. And then you have like homeopathy as an example or sound, uh, sound healing and all those types of things that are rooted in allowing the emotional complexity inside the person to be resolved so that the outer manifestation of whatever disease that they're having gets cured. So one is coming from the outside in and the other is coming from the inside out. Do you see this process? So our medicine has been deeply, deeply conditioned through this 2000 years, through the development of the masculine to look at our, to develop and understand the anatomy from the inside. And we're still deeply confused about how the brain works. We're still only learning about this process, how emotions are intimately connected in that sense. So the left also, also correlates to science and objectivity, right? So we need to objectify something. And what's beautiful here is that when you look at certain cultures like Germany, as an example, it's, it's like linear and logical. You look at a lot of the universities, linear and logical in this process. We're reading, we're articulating. It's very much about language, but we know that language can be interpreted and misinterpreted in such an easy uh, way, right? You just have to take somebody that lives in South America to speak Spanish to somebody that's living, say for instance, China, and you put the two together. Like the only way for them to truly communicate is intuitively through their hands or through facial features or pointing. But through language, it's a mismatch. Language, law, left brain, overstimulating, overdevelopment. So when we have the left brain, we have people that are deeply, deeply rooted in the logical process, strategy, masculine principle. If I do this, then that will happen. And I'm going to consistently do that. 
Whereas we're moving into a stage in our lives in which we're using the right side as a sensory perception and the left as observation, which is the balance. Now you've got to understand something deeply about this left and right brain that I need to capture is that when we have science and spirituality as separate, we have the rejection of astrology because how is it possible that astrology could exist? Like how, wh why is astrology so deeply demonized by society? Because on some deep level, it's a truth in which inherently requires an inner knowledge an inner exploration of oneself an acknowledgement of that, the, the, the realization of God within. But if God is existential, then atheism, as an example, materializes because through pure leftness, we just have, well, if you can't see God, then where is he? He must not exist. Yes, that's true. Okay. We have all these wars, but God tells us that he loves us. I, I don't get it. If he loves everybody, but yet we're killing each other for those types of things, there's, there's like logical things that are breaking over here. And we've, we've allowed ourselves through the development of masculine principle to be completely and utterly convinced. And for me as a soul that has lived these multiple lifetimes of so many of these archetypes, like gone, yeah, we need to invade that country because my faith tells me this. So the faith is the thing that justifies our reality through morals. And then we have the law that says, okay, well, we, we create these laws around over here and you can't exist within this framework. This is the law. And we do this. We, what we do within our own consciousness is that we have these moral codes and then we make judgments, law, left, based on these moral codes that are deeply rooted in our own truth, faith. And there's, there's, they're not working because they're not rooted in the soul awareness. They're rooted in the balance of left and right brain relative to the conditioning. So, you know, you look at India as an example and their sacredness through their faith is rooted in the cows, the cows are sacred. Whereas you come to this part of the world, Western part, we actually, through logic and strategy, require us to have a certain amount of milk on the shelves. And the way that we get that milk is through naturally going, okay, well, we need a cow to make the milk. So this is how we're going to do it. Strategically speaking, if we have certain amounts of cows do this amount of milk, then we'll be able to produce for that shop over there and that store over there and that store over there, which will then calculate to our capitalism and our process of profit. And so we don't even connect to the emotional capacity of what we're doing to any of the animals <laughs> in that sense, because really we're just worried about the strategic process of how that's going to get from there to the store. So we can charge this amount relative to our strategies and our um, millions and millions of paper reports that we have, that we sit and, and discuss over, you know, cookies and, and tea at a board meeting, how are we going to make profit and what type of communication we've got to have with this and how are we going to set up this system and stuff like that. You can see the separateness in that process. And it's all because of the division of the left and right brain. So eventually we move on to more deeper processes, which everybody can remember. And I, I know I'm running out of time over here, so I hope I'm going to be able to do this. But when we look at persecution and division, exclusion, exclusion, suppression, and class distinction. Concept of the king and the priest. This is what I meant about this. The king would be the guy that stays with the law, the law of the land, and the priest would then initiate the truth to the masses through religion. And that's just how the left and right brain would be conditioned. Basically, the truth, the religion, and the king would say, this is the law. So over here, let's look at this picture again. And I had this in a previous talk. Look at where we're looking for God. Look at what we're surrendering to. Look at the way in which this thing is created. Look at the priest over here saying, I'll bless you for your sins relative to our inability to know what it is that you're actually doing. So we're going to tie you to this. You're going to have a deep and painful and excruciating experience. And it's all going to come in the name of God, <laughs> right? But our God. And again, if you look at, look there, look at the cross that exists there. Look at the cross. Look at the weaponry, look at the book, the Bible, the, the law that we're going to read relative to the belief systems that are being created. When anybody knows about EA truly, you'll understand that Jupiter, ninth house and Sagittarius correlates to the exploration of truth and the cu cultural dynamics that are held within those belief systems. And then you have Saturn that just comes after in the 10th house says, okay, now we're going to create a structure in which those truths exist within left and right brain, law and beliefs. So this guy 
in some sense is reading the truth to this person and how the law has created that this person has broken the law. So you've behaved this way. Our truth says this, therefore you've broken the law. And so therefore you're going to be persecuted for it. It's no different to where we are right now. And there are benefits to law, of course. So this is not a, a demonization of those things. It's just looking at what we've experienced. Look at the architecture in the background, pointedness. Okay. It's silly things, the Virgo process, the Virgo-ness, the precision in which everything, remember the Virgo Pisces, Pisces axis, Virgo initiates itself halfway through. So a thousand years into this Virgo, this Virgo Pisces experience, the Virgo consciousness begins to bring in. And that's where we start to see more of this um, persecution and experience exist and division, right? The cleansiness, which we'll get onto over here. So again, this whole entire imagery evokes such intense archetypal structure of what we've experienced through this Virgo Pisces. Look at this, yeah, gay, uh, shame, selfishness, hopeless, careless, wrong. All of us that carry Virgo on some deep level have got man-made guilt, right? We've got shame. We're coming from the Roman and Greek era, okay, specifically those because those were the times in which the gods, masculine gods living outside in the, in, in the, in the, the, um, uh, the clouds and how a lot of war was created, the dominance. We're going to take your territory. Masculine principle, yang. We're going to, to conquer in that sense. So what we have here is we have this process of more, the development, the ex like the masculine principle is about exploration. So on some level, in a, in a natural sense, all this was was just an exploration of different like territory. But in order to get the territory, we needed to be in conflict with other people, with conflict with other, with other tribes that would be existing there. And we would dominate. We would destroy and take over and conquer and say, this is ours in a masculine way, right? And so those times were deeply, deeply embedded by the, the king. And then, you know, the ranking system that existed there, the pharaoh that sits at the top that initiates through... The, the priests and the nobles that would then give to the scribes and the scribes who write the law and the soldiers were in, in, enforce it. It's no different to where we live today. The craftsmen and uh, the farmers would be, and the slaves would be the process in which would support and hold up this whole entire thing. Again, we're looking at the process of Capricorn here relative to the Virgo archetype. Remember the earth trine, Capricorn sits at the top as the, as the, the dictator, the oppression. The Virgo constellation correlates to the slavery process, right? If you keep people in a deep state of, of shame and lack of self-worth and a process of just being beaten down and castrated and in the process of, of um, not being able to actually have any worth, Taurus, Taurus, the archetype of the inner relationship, self-worth, then what you have here is the whole entire control and domination exercise through the Virgo Pisces axis. So for any of you that have got planets in the Capricorn, Taurus, and Virgo constellations, or got trines or squares, etc., activating those things, on some level, those archetypes would have been present in your life growing up, or still are there, where you, you know, you're looking to heal those aspects of yourself in different timelines in which you've been part of it. And especially the feminine principle, as the masculine man would say, well, I'd have three women. And if one of those women that I say are mine looked at a different man, I would then just castrate them to, to, to live in the catacombs and, and there would be this internalization of deep guilt. I'm not allowed to look at another man, which is completely natural, the feminine principle. And so the masculine would just dominate in that sense. So we divided ourselves and created class, right? I mean, you just have to look at the film, um, the first one, which was uh, The Pirates of the Caribbean. You could see that there was a class distinction. I mean, that's a really great film in terms of what came to mind instantly was how, um, you know, there's a lot of lifetimes in which, say, for instance, somebody that was that love could transcend. It didn't have any of these definitions. Right. So if, say, for instance, the, the princess or somebody that was part of the mayor, his daughter would want to look at a, a person that just lived in the normal peasant area. She fell in love with him or they find a common thing. They would never be able to, to marry because it would be class distinction. 
a, co a conflict of interest? How can a peasant that has not been brought up with these cultural norms be marrying into a family? That would be horrendous. And on some level, it still exists today. This is really, really profound. And I, I encourage anybody to actually, um, you know, find the material. Uh, I actually have it. But find the material on Jeffrey Wolf Green's talk on the Dark Eros. And this is, this is something that, is some, you know, we, we still are learning to, to work through a lot in this period of time. I know I definitely am um, working to heal this, this part of myself. Yeah, but the Dark Eros. And Jeffrey talks about it in terms of the Dark Eros, but what he's really talking about is the distortion of sexuality and deep rage and emotional suppression that is rooted in humanity relative to patriarchy, relative to the distortion, relative to the, the separation from the womb. You know, when we demonize the feminine principle, we, we put miss or misses as beneath, right? The, the man would always take the, 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 the woman's or his wife's um, a name away. It would be gone. She would have to take his. And that would be a process of now owning, right? The, the dad would give away his daughter to the man. These, all these types of behaviors and traditions that we've rooted in are present because of that. But for most of you that are maybe sitting here today, you've actually experienced where you've gone like, no, if I'm going to get married or live with somebody that's my partner, I'm going to kind of keep my surname because that's me. It's an identity. <laughs> in some level, I'm not going to be traded off. So when we look at these things over here, especially the dark eros, each of us, as Jeffrey talks about, we've got a natural way in which we operate in terms of our sexuality, in terms of what's natural for us, in terms of what we are creative with within our ways. And this is a beautiful explanation because you've got this part over here, the brainstem, which would be the Mars archetype. So we're looking at Mars over here. That's why this all looks like aggression because it's the Mars energy that exists here. And you have the forebrain or the cerebral or the prefrontal cortex, which has been deeply, deeply, deeply conditioned by psychological and emotional dynamics rooted in social conditioning. Especially in the last like 100 years, we've had like role, gender role assignments. So these gender role assignments have been rooted in our ability to say, okay, well, I'm the man, I go do this, you're the woman, you go do that. Yet, we're not that simple. We're deeply, deeply complex human beings that have been homogenized in such an intense way that a lot of our truths have actually created this deep suppression relative to our own brain. Remember the left and right brain I talked about? Remember the way that the brain operates? All of these thoughts become the suppression of what's natural and emotional for us. So as an example, you might have Mars and Aries and you into a relationship and the relationship says, well, you're not allowed to be free in your expression and very instinctual in the way that you express your sexuality. You've got to be all petite and primitive like that. It's like, it's never going to work. Think about a Mars and Aries soul that needs to be in a relationship. They can't be in a relationship that says you need to just be um, like uh, monogamous in that sense. It's going to be deeply traumatizing, honestly, because on some level they require the freedom to explore themselves. And it doesn't mean go sleep around with everybody, walk around with everybody. It just means that for them, it's not really that good to have a kind of like very uh, uh, um, one-dimensional relationship unless the partner is the same. And then it's open for that experience. So we each have different ways in which we experience that. And so if we take one homogenized way of being through social construction and religious conditioning and faith, then what we're going to have is this deep suppression of who we are and whatever gets suppressed, natural law states that which is suppressed will, or will eventually return to its natural state. And I come from South Africa. I grew up in the apartheid area, not specifically dur during the seventies and eighties, but I grew up during the nineties. And one of the reasons why I live abroad is because through the natural balancing of when the white government, uh, like dissolved, Pluto, uh, pardon me, Uranus and Neptune, conjunction, Capricorn, 1993, 1994. And in 1994, 1995, President uh, you know, Mandela becomes, uh, or he becomes president through his deep story of you know, being in, in jail and all of this type of stuff. And he, he gives the black race. The, 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 this is just their skin color. 
But you've got to understand that the primitive behavior over here is because of the deep suppression. And while I was doing this research, I was looking at a lot of imagery here that was intensely disturbing. And this is not something that's just exclusive to South Africa. It's just that the most recent expressions of apartheid, in other words, the segregation, the division, the left and rightness that has been separated in the brain. This process has led us to having these emotions that are raw. Pluto conjunct Mars, Pluto square Mars, Pluto oppose Mars. These emotions are raw that come out that have been deeply suppressed because it's not natural for people to be kept in cages and to behave this way. Even our animals, as an example, we do that without even thinking, right? This process here, it's there and it comes up to the surface and all of a sudden you have violence, you have anger, you have distortion. And it's such, it's such a, a, a painful experience. You just have to look at the states and the, the deep like distortion that's occurred um, through your own process of history. Martin Luther King and what he represented as an example, I'm not really well versed in that, but I've seen and experienced some of the imagery to understand that there's something relatable here. Look, at this was taken from the recent G20 summit that just took place with, um, with the Mars opposed Pluto. Mars was in Cancer, conjunct the Sun, and Pluto was conjunct the Moon in a balsamic phase, just recently this full moon. Look what happened. Germany, Jeffrey talks about in, in a way where he, he shares with us, you know, Germany is one of the states also that has got this deep, dark eros um, symbolism there. Unrepressed emotions, repressed, 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 repressed emotions that have become so distorted that now when they come to the surface, is this deep, deep, deep rage of anger in which materializes as complete destruction and violence and the over anarchy. So the ramifications of the immaturity that has materialized over the last 2000 years from this Virgo Pisces axis and patriarchy and religious conditioning and separation has led us to what we're seeing here today. And we've got to go through this no matter what we've got to go through this. And it's sometimes going to be a very painful experience. This is my final slide, everybody. So I hope that the time hasn't run over and I'm sorry for the next person. <laughs> but this is something that I wanted to share with you. And this is, this is going to be a little bit confrontational. Whoops. Okay. So no mutation, the truth and the tribe, gender roles, family commitments, and no individuality. What I mean by this process is that, you know, anybody that's got an 11th house Pluto, anybody that's got strong 11th house experiences or a lot of Uranian uh, situations, Mars in Aquarius, Venus in Aquarius as an example. When you look at the social structure of, and this is something that we, you've got to really see into it. You know, I'm going to try to capture imagination here, but really see into it. Think about the gender roles and family dynamics that occur and what types of truths hold and model what is acceptable behavior and what is not acceptable behavior regarding a family and the traditions. I highly, highly encourage you to watch a film called Moana, okay, to really understand what this is about and what this means in relationship to the, un, like to the, to Pluto through Aquarius, the ongoing awakening within each of us and our relationship to our own family members and stuff like that. The black sheep of the family, the Aquarius, right? You have this, this non-conformity aspect of yourself. Your whole entire family is deeply, deeply rooted in saying, nope, this is religion. This is the faith. This is the way that we keep ourselves safe. This is how we've kept ourselves safe for many, 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 many years. This is an ongoing tradition. This is what we do. You come along and say, I have Pluto, I have Jupiter, I have uh, Mars, all in this, not me personally, I'm just suggesting different um, configurations. And you've got this Aquarius symbol and Aquarius is like, uh-uh, no, I'm all about mutation. I'm all about like deconditioning. I don't want to follow the rules. I want to be rebellious. I want to change the way that we genetically define ourselves. So through this process, in the last Pisces age, through the way that we have constructed family dynamics, the, the, the father sits at the top and so he gives the orders, the law, the mom, the deep faith process, 
relative to their faith. So the family has a faith, the, the, the family structure, extended family, cousins, uncles, etc. they have a faith. And then in that faith, there is a law that says, this is how you behave. And you one day say, I don't want to go to church. Does God really exist? Maybe to you, he does. But to me, I find a different way of doing that. No, Sally, you're coming to truth. You coming to, to, to church with us. I don't want to, I don't, I don't think this is okay for me. I don't want to experience it. I'd rather go play with my friend because that's where I experience the oneness in me. Why do you have to be so different? Why do you have to be this? That it, you can hear the judgment, the persecution, the belittling, the shaming experience that occurs. So what we have here is we have this tribal experience in which everything is about, we have this role to play. And if we don't adhere to those roles, then there's something wrong with us. And we internalize this, some, these unconscious, um, and subjective experiences, and that leads us to deeply, deeply saying our individuality just gets suppressed and suppressed and suppressed until we act out of randomness and we we do something that causes the family to look at us and say, we never could understand why you behave this way, or you know, why aren't you doing this, or why aren't you doing that, or why I've supported you this way. It's all the blame, and really what it's about, it's just that when you look at the most recent religious conditioning, like for instance, if you were a nun or a priest, as an example, there were certain behavior patterns that you had to adhere to. And if you had desires, natural desires, the flesh desires, you couldn't adhere to them. So you would suppress them. So just the same here, you would suppress these processes, act out of randomness, run away from your family and create deep comic dynamics in which the bond between you two in your family would be, not resolved in a way which there would be a natural separation. It would be traumatizing. And I know that I carry some of that as well. So not this one, but you have shamed our family. Get out of here and never come back. Those types of, those types of stories, many of you have lived, if you've got an 11th house Pluto, a south node in the 11th house, right? Rejected, ostracized, um, and, and kicked out of group dynamics for being different because there is no mutation in the tribe. There is no mutation within the process of the family commitments because it's not about individuality. It's about the process of what the society and the law and the faith exists within. So as we move into the Aquarius age processing and we begin to recognize the difference between resonance and faith, we'll start to realize that we are going to have a lot of confrontation with our families because their structure is still going to be rooted in the process of their ideologies and belief systems and truths that are rooted in the separateness. Whereas the new way is I don't resonate with this anymore. And my individuality one it puts me on that fractal and find people that do that and do this and so on and so forth. And that process actually begins to mutate our genetics. As we begin to explore different cultures, we begin to travel to different parts of the world and interact with different types of threading of different genetics. Somebody from Australia moves to Taiwan, for instance, and find somebody that they mate with. And they create a whole entire family that has a different ideology and belief system that's not even rooted in whatever their cosmologies were when they grew up. And so this is the, the Pluto through Sagittarius transit, the great migration, Saturn through Sagittarius. So as we begin to recognize the relationship that we have to our parents and we have to our family dynamics, I wouldn't be surprised if many of us with this deep Aquarius mutation process of awakening ourselves are going to feel rejected and ostracized and, and, you know, like we can't connect with our families in some way. And it's just really because again, it's the process of gender roles and this is not what you're supposed to do in that sense. Okay, everyone, thanks very much for letting me uh, babble on for this amount of time. I really hope this was, um, you know, capturing in some way, shape or form. Um, I don't actually know what, what time it is, but I'm going to stop the sharing over here. Four minutes over. Um, but yeah, I'll just end off over there in terms of that. If anybody's got something to say for a couple of minutes, otherwise. Simon, thank you so much. That was so brilliant. Thank you. Any quick questions or comments from anybody? I have a south node in the 11th house and Mars in Aquarius, and it's uh, just supporting all your statements. It's certainly true what, true what you had to say about the deconditioning and separating, but it's more, of a, it's more of the initiative that you take upon yourself. You don't really feel bad about it. It's just instinctual. You know, you go on your own, and it is what it is. And what's interesting is that your family 
for me, my family is very supportive in their own unique way. But um, yes, I just wanted to support what you said with my experience. Cool. Amazing. Thank you so much. I know it's, it's wonderful to be able to have a couple of, um, well, not a couple, but there are many people out there that have had supportive processes, even if it's been uniquely different. Okay. Anyone else? Hi, Simon. I just wanted to say again, you know, like I said in your last presentation, thank you, brother. Just, I totally can relate to this like I say, as, as a, uh, uh, of the uh, Pluto Uranus uh, conjunction generation, and I also have a square to the nose from Aquarius. Um, right. Definitely the black shoe to the family, uh, and and with these transiting uh, nodes hitting my uh, squares to the nodes, all this is coming back up again. Yeah, and especially our relationship to the authoritative in terms of governmental structures and those rules that are being imposed because with Pluto through Capricorn, a lot of you that are part of this generation are going to be like, no, we don't want that existential patriarchal father giving us the direction. We actually you know, want to operate from our own Uranian field. And that can be like deeply disturbing to you guys. So, Simon, thank you so much for teaching this very clearly and, you know, helping people to understand. So thank you very much from all of us. I'll just unmute everybody. Thank Thanks very much. Thanks, Simon. Thank you, thank you. Simon. Thank Fantastic. you, Simon. Bravo. Thank you, Linda. Gracias. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. Thank you.